وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode in this series based on the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, call upon me and I will answer you. There is something in dua which sometimes we hear particularly, I mean, generally speaking, a lot of us hear our dua when we hear dua extensively is in Ramadan, when the Imam is making dua in the witr prayer. We hear a lot of times, this is where we hear many of the uh, of the supplications that people make and, and we kind of get a broader understanding of supplication, a lot of us from that. Uh, there is something that we that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discouraged and the people generally speaking, uh, it, it was something discouraged. And that is to make the request uh, have rhyming and to kind of form something they call it a sajr, like a rhyme and a, and a sort of a deliberately structure your dua like that. And if that is done deliberately and a person is kind of dressing up their words to make sure that each word rhymes with the other one, then this is something which is not from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. If naturally a person is making dua, and it happens to be that their dua has a rhyme to it or a flow to it or a rhythm to it, then that is something which is not uh, harmful if it's not done deliberately. But there's sometimes an effort to be very, very eloquent in the dua in, and to make the dua more like, a, you know, like, like poetry more than, a, 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 more than pleading to Allah. So it's really important to, to, that we bear in mind this issue of humility and submission before Allah and we make our dua humble and sincere and not that we dress up our dua with kind of very eloquent words and clever rhymes and you know uh, an interesting rhythm in the dua in order to make it sound really sort of uh, eloquent that's that goes against the concept of pleading and that's why Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih rahimahullah ta'ala he said in Kitab al-Da'wat in the Book, the book of dua in which he dealt with the different duas. Babu ma yukrahu min as fi dua. The chapter of what has come regarding the dislike or the prohibition of a saja of rhyming and making that rhyme and rhythm in the dua. Then he mentioned his chain of narration to Ikrima from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma that he said, Fandur as saja min al dua. فَاجْتَنِبْهُ فَإِنِّي أَعَدْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَأَصْحَابَهُ لَا يَفْعَلُونَ إِلَّا ذَلِكَ يعني لا يفعلون إلا ذلك الاجتناب. He said, and this is at the end of the, the hadith that he quoted, be careful of this kind of rhyming in your dua, keep away from it. For I was with or I lived at the time of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and his companions and I found that they were not doing except this i.e. they were not doing anything except keeping away from they were keeping uh, away from this and that is when we say sort of like forming uh, lines like you would form poetry so that it has a particular rhythm and a particular rhyme and a particular flow and that, as we said, goes against the concept of humility and submissiveness when making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it happens naturally, that's different. But it's not an, a competition in uh, your linguistic skill. It's a matter of pleading before, uh, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person is not, uh, is not forming their dua in the way of poetry and rhyme and rhythm, but the person is asking and pleading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason I particularly uh, mentioned the issue of Ramadan is that the witr, the dua in witr in Ramadan, very sadly, 
for many people has become almost like a competition in eloquence. And we see the, many of the imma in the masajid going away from the dua that the Prophet ﷺ used to make and away from the sunnah and instead bringing things that no one else has brought and then forming it into rhyme and poetry and rhythm and so on to make it sound really uh, sort of eloquent. Uh, and when you go back, you, you feel that subhanAllah, if they were to stick to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and they were to stick to the dua that the Prophet ﷺ made, it would have been better for them. It would have been better for them because this kind of uh, forming of this, these you know, hugely eloquent rhyming uh, sentences that have flow and rhythm, it takes away from al-ikhlas and al-khushu' and al-iftiqar, away from sincerity, away from concentration, away from presenting yourself as being poor and needy uh, before Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now if you imagine, I'm just going to give you an, an example, walillahi al-mathal al-a'la, to Allah, belong the best, to Allah belongs the best example. But if I just give you an example of a person who goes before a king and wants to beg the king to, you know, to spare them or to beg the king to support them in something. And they go and then they stand there and they, you know, they present this, you know, sort of long flowing rhyme with clever words in it and clever wordplay in it. The person's going to say, the king will turn around and say, are you, are you serious? You know, you came here to, you know, show off your linguistic skills or you came here to, you know, to ask me for something. And a person starts rhyming words and making clever rhythms and, and flowing, making the sentence flow. And then this word flows with this word. And it doesn't sound like the person is genuinely serious and pleading. But if a person naturally is eloquent in their speech and when they plead with Allah, it has a natural eloquence to it then inshallah ta'ala, there is no harm in that bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. Inshallah, there is no harm if it is something natural, that a person has a natural eloquence in their speech and naturally their words flow very nicely. But for a person to be concentrating more on the flow of their words and less on the content, this is what is meant by uh, the as-saj'a al-madhmoom, the, the blameworthy kind of rhyming that people do in their dua. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar ta'ala said, explaining the hadith of Ibn Abbas that we spoke about, he said, وَلَا يَلِدُوا عَلَى ذَلِكَ مَا وَقَعَ فِي الْأَحَادِيثِ الصَّحِيحَةِ He said, this is not contradicted by what has been found in the authentic ahadith, i.e., you know, a certain degree of eloquence in dua in, in the ahadith which are authentic from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لِأَنَّ ذَلِكَ كَانَ يَسْطُرُ مِنْ غَيْرِ قَصْدٍ إِلَيْهِ because that used to happen without the Prophet ﷺ deliberately sort of concentrating upon forming that. He said, that's why sometimes you find uh, a hadith which contain dua from the Prophet ﷺ that contain this kind of eloquence that just comes naturally. When, like when the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma munzil al-kitab, sari' al-hisab, hazim al-ahzab. Oh Allah, the one who sent down the book, who is swift to take account, who destroyed the confederates or destroyed the ahzab or defeated the ahzab. Here you can see how it rhymes and how it flows. Munzil al-kitab, sari' al-hisab, hazim al-ahzab. But it's not deliberate. It's not something where it, the aim is to show your eloquence and to show how you can find words that all rhyme with each other and all flow with each other. It just came naturally in that sentence. That's one example that Hafiz ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned. Another example that Hafiz ibn Hajar mentioned rahimahullah ta'ala was the dua on as-safa and al-marwa, sadaqa wa'da, wa'azza junda, the hadith, or the hadith sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al-ahzaba wahda, you find this kind of rhyme and flow within some of the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. But it's not done in a way that is deliberately trying to, that's not the goal behind it. It just, it sometimes just comes out like that. Or like the hadith uh, the pro that the Prophet ﷺ, when he made du'a and he said, أعوذ بك من عين لا تدمع ونفس لا تشبع وقلب لا يخشع uh, The hadith, ودعاء لا يسمع and so on. This is, the intention here is not to rhyme. Uh, and it's, it, the intention here is not to show eloquence uh, in the language, but it just comes 
it just comes naturally. So that, uh, like Al Hafiz ibn Hajar, he said, وَكُلُّهَا صَحِيحَةً All of that is authentic from the Prophet ﷺ. But what's blameworthy is when a person intends to do that. They're like deliberately trying to form their du'as in such a way that they, that they have this kind of rhyme and eloquence and, and flow. Another thing that a person should avoid when making du'a is a lahn, and that is to make errors in the language, to make mistakes, grammatical mistakes, mistakes in the way the sentences are formed, mistakes in the way that the words are read or the ends of the words, uh, particularly when that lahan, when those errors could even change the meaning. They could, they could potentially change the meaning of what a person says. Abu Uthman al-Mazini said to some of his students, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, alayka bin nahu. He said that you must study grammar. فَإِنَّ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ كَفَرَتْ بِحَرْفٍ ثَقِيلٍ خَفَّفُوا Subhanallah. He said, Bani Israel disbelieved because of a letter that should have been doubled and they made it a single letter. And then he explains what they mean. And he said, قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ لِعِيسَى إِنِّي وَلَدْتُكْ فَقَالُوا إِنِّي وَلَدْتُكْ فَكَفَرُوا they changed the word by one letter, one doubling of a letter, until they said that they, they said when they changed the letter, what they brought is that I gave birth to you, and I was your father. And that's not what Allah Azza wa Jal said. So they disbelieved because of a single letter that was changed, a single letter that became that should have been a double letter that became a single letter. So this is something that is worth uh, a person giving great attention to, to make sure that when they're making dua, they're making dua in the way that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu did to the, best of, to the best of their ability. And that's why Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala spoke about a man who made a dua and he made grammatical errors in it. And a man said, Allah will not accept a dua which has grammatical errors. So Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala, he responded, مَنْ قَالَ هَذَا الْقَوْلِ فَهُوَ آثِمٌ مُخَالِفٌ لِلْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَلِمَا كَانَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَفِ He said, whoever says this, that Allah will never accept a dua that has a grammatical mistake, this person is sinful. They've gone against the Qur'an and the Sunnah and what the early generations were upon. أَمَّا مَنْ دَعَى اللَّهَ مُخْلِصًا لَهُ الدِّينِ بِدُعَاءٍ جَائِزِ سَمِعَهُ اللَّهُ وَأَجَابَ دُعَاءَهُ سَوَاءَ كَانَ مُعْرَبًا أَوْ مَلْحُونًا He said, whoever makes dua to Allah sincerely with a dua that is permissible, Allah hears that dua and Allah will answer that dua, whether it is grammatically correct or whether it has some grammatical uh, mistakes in it. وَالْكَلَامُ المذكور لا أصل له. And what the person said when they said Allah will never answer a dua that has a grammatical mistake, it has no basis to it. He said, but it's befitting for a person. If they're not used to Arabic grammar, then they should not try, they should not be uh, harming themselves and burdening themselves by trying to get this, by trying to get this grammar perfect. قَالَ بَعْضُ السَّلَفِ Some of the early generations, they said, إِذَا جَاءَ الْإِعْرَابِ ذَهَبَ الْخُشُوعِ If a person is trying too hard to get the grammar right, their khushu' will go. Because they, every word they're stopping and thinking should be فَتْحَ هِيَ ضَمَّ هِيَ أُصُونَ وَهَذَا كَمَا يُكْرَهُ تَكَلُّفُ السَّجَعْ فِي الدُّعَاءِ So just like it is disliked to have rhyming and rhythm in the dua, like to make a big effort on that, then it's also disliked for a person to make such a big effort for every sort of last part of their fatha and kasra and dhamma to get it right. But if a person is able to do that without burdening themselves, then there is no harm uh, in that. And that the, the core of the dua, the origin of the dua is the heart. And the tongue is merely expressing and following what is in the heart. 
So how do we join between these two statements? We say it's very important that a person makes their best effort, especially in what changes the meaning. And while we don't require everyone who makes dua to be an expert in Arabic grammar, it is really important that a person tries their very best and a person doesn't say something which would change the meaning of the sentence like was given in the example of Bani Israel. At the same time, expecting perfection in grammar, especially when it takes a person away from their khushu' and concentration, that's also not something that is required from you, that you should be, for example, an expert in Arabic grammar or a scholar of Arabic grammar before you can make dua. Rather, that would exclude the majority of uh, Muslims from being able to make dua. But a person does their best. They try not to say something that would change uh, the meaning. And they try not to allow themselves to become so focused on some element of language like eloquence or rhyming or grammar that they end up losing the heart from uh, the dua. There are now a couple of things that I would like to sort of conclude our discussion on etiquettes of dua with. And this relates to who you make dua for in your dua. And one of the one of the greatest things that you can do is to make dua for other Muslims when you're making dua for yourself. And that has an evidence in the Quran, it has an evidence in the Sunnah of the Prophet. As for the Quran, the statement of Allah Those who came after them, they say, Our Lord, forgive us and forgive our brothers who preceded us in Iman. This is in Surah Al-Hashar, Ayah number 10. Notice how they make dua for themselves and they make dua for, they make dua for themselves and they make dua for their brothers. And that is from the etiquettes that shows sincerity. It's from the things that comes back to you with good because of the angel that said, and for you is the same. And it's from the things which builds a sense of brotherhood in Islam and from the etiquettes of the Sunnah, both uh, we find this in the Quran and also in the Sunnah of uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In a hadith which is narrated by Ubadah ibn al-Samit radiyallahu anhu, qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man istaghfara lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, katab allahu lahu bi kulli mu'minin wa mu'minatin hasana. Whoever asks Allah's forgiveness for the believing men and the believing women, Allah will write for every believing man and woman that, and that covers every one of them, he will write a reward. He will write a reward for, uh, for that person. So subhanAllah, there's so much reward to be had in making dua for your brothers. The angel who says, may you have the same. The reward for everyone that your dua touches and you're asking Allah to forgive the Muslims. For every Muslim that that dua it covers, you receive a reward for it. So there is a lot of reward in making dua for your brothers in Islam. It's also very, very, very important to make dua for your parents. And we know we find this in many places in the Quran, uh, such as the statement of Allah ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمة وقل رب ارحمهما كما رب يعني صغيرا سورة الإسراء between آية number 23 to آية number 24 and particularly uh, the, the part of the ayah in which Allah عز وجل says that say to them a, a generous or say to them a kind word and lower to them the wing of mercy of the, and lower to them the wing of humility and mercy and say, my Lord, have mercy on them as they raised me when I was small. Likewise, the dua of Nuh alayhi salam. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِمَنْ دَخَلَ بَيْتِيَ مُؤْمِنًا وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ O oh Allah, forgive me and my parents and whoever enters my house as a believer and the believing men and the believing 
and the believing women. And that gathers together all of that, those points that we mentioned about people you make dua for. And there's no doubt that when you make that effort uh, for those who have that great right upon you, your parents, and you make that effort uh, for the believing men and the believing women, and you make that effort to mention your brothers in their absence, there's a great deal of good and a great deal of barakah that comes back to you because of that. It's also worth adding that from those that you should take time to make dua for are those in authority. And it's said that this is the difference between Ahl sunnah and others. Is that if you see a person who is making dua for the one in authority, know this person is from Ahl sunnah And if you see a person making dua for, against the one in authority, then know this is from the, these are from the people of innovation, as it has been said. And this can be taken from the hadith in Sahih Muslim, from the hadith of Tamim ibn Awsin al-Dari radiyallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ad nasiha this religion is acting sincerely. Qalu liman ya Rasulullah. They said, to whom, O Messenger of Allah? Qala lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi wa li a'immati muslimina wa ammatihim. To Allah, to his book, to his messenger, to the leaders of the Muslims and the general and the general people. Likewise, in the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu, Sahih Muslim, إن الله يرضى لكم ثلاثة أن تعبدوه ولا تشركوا به شيئا وأن تعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا وأن تناصحوا من ولى الله أمركم. Allah is pleased for you to do three things: that you worship Allah and don't make any partner with Him; that you hold on to the rope of Allah together and do not be divided. And that you offer sincere advice or that you act sincerely towards those that Allah has placed in authority over you. So one of the ways that this can be shown is by making dua for them. And that doesn't matter if they are righteous or not righteous. It doesn't matter if they are bringing a great deal of good for the Muslims or even if they are placing obstacles. Because ultimately by making dua for them, if Allah brings righteousness to them and guidance to them, then that righteousness inshaAllah ta'ala will spread out to many, many other Muslims who are under their authority. So a person should take time out to make dua for those in authority over them, to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide them, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire them to fulfill their obligations properly and so on. And a person can find many examples of that within the kalam of the salaf rahimahullah ta'ala, within the statements of the early generations. May Allah have mercy on them all. That brings us to the end of what I wanted to mention regarding many of the etiquettes of dua. There still remain some etiquettes that we need to speak about inshallah ta'ala, but what we will do is we'll take those within the examples that we're going to give. So the next stage of the course inshallah ta'ala is to look at some of the comprehensive dua that the Prophet Sallallahu used to make and to explain some of them and to look at the benefits that we can extract from them. And that's coming up in the next episode, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How can you do a two second action right now that will give you a share of the reward of everything we're doing on this YouTube channel? Simple. Like this video and click subscribe. Why? It will allow YouTube to recommend our videos to other users. And imagine the huge amount of reward that could be waiting for you on the day of judgment if you did that with a sincere intention of spreading the deen of Allah. You'll be rewarded for every single person who benefits from one of our videos as a result of your like or subscribe. That's an easy two second action that you definitely don't want to miss out on. Do it now, click like and subscribe and don't forget to make that intention.